Welcome to the Patricia Fripp Sales Series. You are in for a treat. You're about to meet one of my new, soon to be considered best friends. And in case you are not familiar with David Hoffeld, he is the author of The Science of Selling and our conversations are going to be about the information in that book. He is the CEO and chief sales trainer of the research-based sales and consulting firm, which guess what, is called the Hoffeld Group. And his sales and leadership information has been in all the publications that I wish I could boast I was in. Listen to this company. News and World Report, the Wall Street Journal and Harvard Business Review. Wow, that's impressive. Welcome, David. Thank you so much. And today, you will learn how to align how you sell with how the brain is wired to make a buying decision. So I'm excited to be here, Patricia. Well, gosh, and I'm excited to hear as much as I know our guests are. We understand many of you are watching the replay and some of you are live. We are very happy that you registered either way and you all will have a special gift at the end, so stay tuned. If you're a regular to the Fripp VT sales series, you know another very important part of our team is our moderator, Paul, and Paul will tell you how you can engage with us. Take it away, Paul. Thank you, hello everyone. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see a chat window. Within that chat window, you'll be able to interact throughout the call and ask your short, specific questions. Please make sure to put in a question sooner rather than later so we will have time. In addition to the chat area, there's also going to be a polling question that comes up occasionally throughout the call, and you'll click your vote, I'll click your answer, then vote, and we'll discuss the results. We'll go ahead and start the first polling question. Do you believe that extroverted people are better salespeople? Just click your answer, click vote, and then we'll have the next question shortly after we discuss the results. Well, wonderful. Well, while our friends are answering that poll, David, how did you get interested in such a fascinating subject? It was many years ago, in fact, when I was actually in an argument, Patricia, with a colleague, and we were arguing about, we were putting together a sales training class, and we were strategizing on how do we help salespeople build rapport, and I advocated one behavior, and he said, you know, David, I don't think we should do that. In fact, that's an old sales gimmick. And I said, no, you don't understand. This will work. I've seen it work. It's worked for me and others I've trained. And he said, David, I've tried that, and it didn't work for me. And I've, years ago, I trained people to do it, and they always said it didn't work either. And so I walked out of there with kind of wondering, am I really right? And the, the sales behaviors I'm doing, are they helping me and others that I'm training on my sales team to sell? And it was about that time that I stumbled on an academic journal in social psychology, which Patricia is literally defined as the scientific study of how human beings are influenced in a social setting. And I read this journal, and there was one particular article in it that I found very relevant to what I do every day as a sales professional. So I applied it, and I saw some results. And so I adopted a very odd habit, and that is I began to read academic journals in social psychology, cognitive psychology, uh, neuroscience, behavioral economics, and I began applying them to the world of sales. And the results were astounding. It allowed me to really begin to understand how the brain is wired to be influenced and create a buying decision. And I saw such results with it personally with myself and the team that I was working with as a VP of sales at the time that I began to train other organizations and launch my own training firm back in 2009. And so we've been going strong since then and it's really exciting. In fact, I believe there's never been a more exciting time to be in sales because of this explosion of scientific research on how our brains make choices. Wow, well, you certainly have got me excited as if I were, wasn't beforehand. <laughs> now, Paul, what is the answer to our poll? Well, we have 29% said, yes, they do believe extroverted people are better salespeople. And 71% said, no, they do not believe that extroverted people are better salespeople. Well, we're going to find out 
what the science is behind that question. So, so David, can you tell us what do most of us believe that science proves we're wrong? Yeah, all of us, it seems, have, we make a lot of assumptions about selling, but what I found early on with many others, once they look at the research, find is often those assumptions are wrong. So a couple quick examples. One of them is the question that we just polled, and that is, do extroverts make the best salespeople? Now, most of the tests that salespeople are given, these psychodynamic tests we give them when we interview them, are under the assumption that extroverts do make the best salespeople. In fact, they ask salespeople questions like, when you're at a party, do you go around and talk to everyone or do you stand more off to the side? And every salesperson who's ever been asked a question like that knows the right answer. And you want to say, well, I talk to everybody. Well, why is that? The assumption that extroverts do make the best salespeople. But Patricia, here's what the research finds. When you look at numerous studies that have analyzed this, the results are very surprising. If you think about extroversion and introversion on a scale, what the research shows is that extroverts are slightly better salespeople than introverts, by just a slight margin. But what's most fascinating is who is better than extroverts. What the research shows is that ambiverts, those who are not extroverts, not introverts, but directly in the middle, outsell extroverts at a ratio of two to one. Wow. So who should we be looking for when we hire salespeople? Not extroverts, not introverts, ambiverts are by far the best salespeople. Another topic that we often get wrong is closing. We view closing historically is looked at as the time at the end of the sale when you ask people to make a big decision. And usually for most sales processes, this is the first major commitment they've made throughout the entire sale. But here's what now decades of research shows. That is not how our brains make buying decisions. What the research shows is fascinating and very important when it comes to selling. The research conclusively verifies that our brains make small incremental commitments that guide us on a progression of consent and naturally advance the sale. And these small commitments are literally the building blocks of the sale. And they are what enable that final commitment of a yes or no at the end of the sale. So we need to start thinking about closing holistically as small incremental commitments that we need to get throughout the sales process. And this helps people make a confident and good buying decision. And the last one I'll share with you that really surprised me, I know when I first read the study, is how you should begin a sales call. One fascinating research study looked at what you should say when you begin a sales call. One of the experiments, a social psychologist named Daniel Howard went to a call center and he analyzed what was the rate of compliance when these salespeople called up homeowners. He found it was 18%. He had them make one change, Patricia, and that is at the beginning of their script, they would ask the homeowner, how are you feeling this evening? How are you feeling this evening? Now, the vast majority of people would use a positive response, and then what happened was compliance went up to 32%. It almost doubled from 18 to 32. And this has been validated over and over and over again. There's a lot of psychological reasons why, but when people say they're feeling good, before you ask them for something, they're more likely to say yes to your request. All right. Now, there are a couple issues here. All right. So, one, you know I've told you that when people say, how are you, I always say busy, specifically, <laughs> what can I do for you? I'm not blowing you off, not yet. I'm giving you a chance, but with me, you need to get to the point. Now, you told me I'm actually in the minority, a little percentage of yes. weird people like me. Yep, you and I are both in that same minority, but we're under 5% of people are like us. The vast majority of people instinctively say, oh, good, how are you doing? Something to that, and that makes them more likely to say yes. Now, what if you said, what if you said, how are you this evening? Saying, oh, miserable. My daughter just ran away from home and my husband's been such a pain in the neck. Would you say 
Well, what would you say in that case? Or what well, would science tell us to say? Yes, science says that shouldn't happen very much, but in the rare case it did, better to know that up front, because we have someone now that's what we call in a negative emotional state. And there's some science-backed ways to handle that. But that's good to know, so I have to get them out of that state, because if they're thinking with that mindset and that perspective, anything you or I say to them is going to be skewed because of it. So think of it as that's the glasses they're wearing. One researcher referred to an emotional state as like wearing rose-colored glasses. When you're in the negative emotions, skew everything. And so it's like you see the world, well, wearing rose-colored glasses, everything just looks rosy. So knowing that would help me because that's what reality is, and I have to try to get them out of that perspective. All right. Well, that is interesting. I would probably say this is obviously not a good time for a conversation. Can I call you tomorrow? Yeah, and some of the times that could be appropriate. Some of the times there are some really interesting things that science shows that people are just sometimes stuck in negative emotions, and oftentimes we can guide them out. If that doesn't work, then you're absolutely right. You need to reschedule for a better time. All right, but you are saying we are not giving anyone, Fripp included, an excuse to not oh. at least attempt to turn the emotions. Absolutely. You have nothing to lose by attempting. You can always eject at any time. So I would say try one or two of these science-backed strategies, and you'll be surprised at how they work, and they work quite effectively. Okay, now while you've been telling us this wonderful information, Paul has at least uh, had a poll of who who mm. is listening in live. Now we know... That, Probably three quarters of the audience is going to watch the replay. But who is with us live, Paul? Can you tell us the demographics? Absolutely. The largest group are business owners, 42%. Then we have 27% sales professionals, 23%, none of the above. And then Denise actually put in that she is a resilient speaker and speaking coach. All right. We have say other sales and sales manager coming in at 4% apiece. Okay, good. Well, that's uh, you've got a nice rounded group. And of course, business owners are speakers and consultants because we are selling our services. And David, you, you and I sell our services. We are business owners. And if we are our best salesperson, we need to understand the science. So what? So you've told us, yes, uh, this is fascinating. We believe a lot is wrong. Now, Talk more about our little actions that have big, make a big difference. Yeah, and that's a great point, oh. Patricia. You yes, know, Frank says, give me an example. Let me give you a couple of them, because you're exactly right. Oftentimes, little things that we overlook can make a profound impact. So let me give you a few of them. We look at things the researchers called heuristics. What heuristics are is mental shortcuts our brains instinctively make. It's how we're able to form rapid choices. For example, when we meet someone, we're able to get a strong first impression of them within a few seconds. Now, how can our brains do this so quickly and so accurately? Well, the way they do that is they leverage heuristics, these rules of thumb that allow us to make rapid judgments. And our brains do this because really otherwise we'd be paralyzed by the amount of decisions we make every day. So, let me give you two examples of these that we can leverage to become more effective at selling because heuristics shape perception. It's how people judge one option or another. So let me give you one that you might be familiar with, many in our audience will, and one that you may not be, but it's very important. First one is one called social proof. Now, what is social proof? Social proof connects the persuasiveness of an idea with how other people are responding to it. My favorite example of social proof is the social pressure all of us feel when we're in an audience. And we're watching a performance and we're, we're pleased and we clap, but we find that others around us begin to rise and give a standing ovation. And for most of us, when that happens, what do we normally do? If you're at the National Speakers Association, you're going to get up and applaud whether you think they deserved it or not. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and what is it? What force is it that causes us to rise from our chair, even if we weren't planning to? And why does it feel so odd to resist that urge? The reason is social proof. It's also why we are all uh, look more favorable on blockbuster movies, businesses with many satisfied customers and best-selling books. 
We say if a lot of people like it or embracing an idea or behavior, it must be good. And this is very important. So we want to leverage social proof in our favor when we're presenting ourselves, our products, or services. So research has shown that presenting uh, yourself or a certain product or service and saying things like, this is our most popular option, or what many people in your situation choose is this, or what many people wonder in your situation is, and letting them know that a lot of other people just like them are considering this option. Social proof reduces the perception of risk. And also, the more alike those you reference are to your potential customers, the more persuasive social proof is and the more it's amplified. So that's just one heuristic you can use. Let me give you a second example, Patricia, that we often overlook, and that is displaying confidence. Our brains instinctively link displays of confidence, confidence with competence and trustworthiness. In fact, a fascinating research study out of Carnegie Mellon analyzed this, and it's kind of alarming, but very revealing. They looked at experts who would present their ideas, who were verifiable experts, and the audience knew it. But these experts presented their ideas and didn't display acts of confidence. They presented them, but they weren't overly confident in their presentation. Then they had people who were not experts present ideas, but they did so in a very confident manner. What happened was alarming. The audience looked more favorably and were more likely to act on the non-experts who displayed their ideas with confidence than the experts who displayed without confidence. So our brains instinctively do that. We need to make sure we're presenting, we're intentionally presenting with confidence. But Patricia, that does raise a question. What happens if you don't feel confident when you're presenting. All of us can relate to that, can't we? Yes, there are occasions even for really self-confident people. <laughs> now, I know what I would say, but I want to hear what the science tells us. There's a number of things you can do. I'll give you two real quickly that the science shows. One is fascinating, and I use these all the time. They're called power movements, power movements. Some fascinating research has come out of Harvard University and numerous other places looked at certain body movements or postures that stimulate feelings of confidence. In fact, some of these body movements I'll share with you actually release testosterone throughout your body, making you within a very short period of time, a matter of minutes, feel more confident. One of these movements is what the researchers refer to as the Wonder Woman pose, which is putting your hands on your hips. That's it. Absolutely. Yes. That Standing like that, even though it may feel a little silly, for one or two minutes will release testosterone throughout your body naturally and make you feel more confident. Also, I recommend that all of us instinctively have power movements. These are movements that we do without thinking about it when we feel confident. So the next time you feel confident, you just sold a few sales or you had a great day, look at how you're moving. Look at your nonverbal communication and try to understand it. Then, when you're not feeling confident, force yourself to move in that way. Force the behaviors. What you'll find is, just like our feelings influence our behaviors, decades of research shows that our behaviors influence our feelings. And as you begin to display nonverbal communication that you link with confidence, you'll begin to feel more confident. Let me give you one more, Patricia, that really surprised me. In fact, of everything we've talked about, this is probably one of the most surprising ones for me. And that was, I saw a number of years ago, many academic journals talking about self-affirmations. And I thought, oh, come on, self-affirmations, that, that can't be right. Why is this in an academic journal? What the research shows is that self-affirmations are linked with heightened levels of confidence. What I got wrong was what self-affirmations are. Yeah. I had been thinking about them in more of a self-help um, you know, type of mentality where I look in the mirror and say, I feel great when I don't 50 times. <laughs> That's not what the research was talking about. What the research talked about, what the researchers were defining as self-affirmations, was the evidence of things you were competent in. In other words, as I'm going into, let's say, a sales call, and I'm nervous, I'm talking to a group of buyers, I think back, when have I done something similar to this with success in the past? 
So I reflect on that. When have I been successful in a similar endeavor? Then I verbally say that, well, that success is evidence that I'll be successful again. The research shows this will calm your nerves and put you in a more productive mental state and let you feel a little more confident and confidence boost performance as well. So something simple, a self-affirmation by reflecting on how you have succeeded in the past and how that's evidence you'll be successful in a similar endeavor. So that and power movements can make a profound difference when you don't feel so confident, but you need to feel it. How do you do that quickly? Those two things, science says, will make a profound difference. Now, when you talk about testosterone, that works even for we Wonder Women women? It, regardless of gender, the research shows. In fact, one of the researchers, the primary researchers in this area out of Harvard is Amy Cuddy out of Harvard Business School. And so she famously says this works for men and it also works for women, regardless. It'll make you feel confident. Good. Well, Paul, before I go back to what I want to hear about, are there any specific questions from our audience or are they just hanging on David's every word? Well, a little bit of both. Um, Joanne asked if David has published any books, and I told her that we're going to discuss that later in the call. Yes. We also had a question from Luis. Um, if we can work it in somewhere, can you give some advice based on your research on cold calling I wasn't able to get clarification, so just general if you have a few, a few minutes on that. And well, anything about cold calling, certainly. If you're on the phone, the example you gave, I assume that was cold calling from a list. Uh, so correct. Say, that's, one, that's one great example, yes. Yeah. Is there, well, one, you have to, even if you're on the phone, you're not walking into an office cold, but how would you... If you were sitting in your office at home making cold calls and a lot of people talk about making money, you know, in your jammies, would you say if you want more confidence, you have to get dressed? Yes, absolutely. Uh, dress is shown not only to change. There's some interesting research on how it shifts perception. The way you're dressed matters a great deal. Uh, there's some really compelling research on that, but also research shows that when you dress certain ways, it'll make you feel more confident, more professional. So it can make a profound difference. And this is just one of the many things that we often overlook, right? We think, well, will it really matter? The evidence shows it doesn't matter a little bit. In fact, it matters a great deal. Well, of course, I do so many more Zoom meetings and webinar jams. So I... Whereas before, I might wear my jeans in the mm. office. And sometimes I, I've had a coaching client this morning, an executive, so I've actually got real clothes, pantyhose, etc. But I do notice I feel considerably different, even if I'm on the phone, not on a web meeting, if I have my makeup and, and I'm slightly better dressed than if, I, if nobody could see me. So just from my own experience, I, that makes perfect sense to me. Good. Any other questions, Paul? Not right now. All right. Well, of course, uh, you know, I, I teach how to make an emotional connection, how to tell stories, how to make your sales presentations more powerfully persuasive. And you have some great research around stories in our sales conversations and presentations. So whatever you can add to that, we're all hanging on to your, your information. You're exactly right. There's so much evidence now on how powerful stories are. People have been saying for years, especially in the sales and speaking world, you have to tell stories and you have to tell them well. But now there's a wealth of data that shows that stories do more than we ever imagined. Mm. In fact, researchers refer to it as the narrative paradigm. What that means in short is that our brains think in terms of stories. We think of things as a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so stories, our brain processes them in very unique ways, much different than more facts or data. Stories don't go through the same analytical scrutiny that when I'm presenting an idea like I am now or a, or a data or a fact, um, we don't scrutinize in the same way. In fact, this is why one of my favorite examples is why we can all watch a movie yes. that we know is fake. 
with actors saying lines, and we can get emotionally moved, and we're well aware that everything we're seeing is fake, but we're still moved by it. Why? Because of how our brains process stories. Not only that, but stories, when they're told correctly, are sticky, and they are stick in our minds. We're far more likely to remember a story than a statement of fact. In fact, one research study found that uh, numerous days after an event, 63% of the participants remembered the story. Only 5% remembered a statement of fact or a piece of data. So stories are ways we can present our messages to our audience. One final thing about stories about regarding how our brain processes them, and that is when a story is told well, the research um, from fMRI machines, which look at brain activity when stories are being told with participants, is that people relive them. Some mm -hmm. fascinating research found that when people hear stories, their brain activity mirrors the speaker of the story's brain activity. Meaning, when a story is told well, we don't just listen to it. We relive it in our mind. We're picturing it. And so a, a strategy that I tell salespeople is the easier it is for people to picture your stories in their mind, the more persuasive they will be. So what the research shows is stories are just too powerful to ignore. And the question is, how can we tell them to help people process them and to take their persuasiveness to the next level? Well, of course, now we are stepping into my world. <laughs> And, yes. and I know you certainly, and I, I want to hear any more that you have to say, but part of the message I give is, and of course, I'm just working with an executive from a hospital this morning, has to give the State of the Union, and you, you, I'm telling you, you have to have stories. Well, mm -hmm. you talk about your customer satisfaction. Go to your website. There are real live people, and you have to get. If you're going to give someone's name, even if you can't actually talk about the client, Mary is a 45 year old, 45 year old single mother with three teenage children. She is the president, the vice president of marketing for Wells Fargo. Give her a backstory so I can see her. I, with very little information, I, I'm connecting. Wow, she's got a, a, a responsible job. She's got three teenagers. Wow, I bet that's a handful. She's doing this alone. I'm already rooting for this character. Something happens. She had a mammogram and she found a lump. And the result of this is, and the result of this is. So, Paul, why don't we take this opportunity is going over to Fripp VT. So those of you who are my Fripp VT users, hello. And this is a challenge for you to revisit not only the webinar series that what we are doing is we are bringing up, we are taking this great content from these interviews, chucking chunking them up into digestible chunks and then we are putting them into your 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 learning center so all these webinars are there chunked up afterwards so you can always go back and listen to this again plus of course you get the replay link and uh, we would challenge you to revisit your content on sales presentations and stories and certainly, and I do believe Paul might be helping someone with a problem because he had, oh, there he is. No, there he is with us. Good. So, Paul, you have superstar sales presentations. And let's see, how, how about chapter six? Nobody can resist a good story well told. And see if you would, David, that you would agree with the snippet of advice we give or if you would add to that, so. Have you noticed, it often seems that our prospects are trained to resist a sales presentation. Don't worry, nobody can resist a good story when it's well told. The reason you tell stories is because your prospects will not remember everything you say. They will remember what they see while they listen to you speak.
When you have strong competition, you have to tell better stories than your competition. Okay, so that's just a little teaser, but you would agree with that. This is just reinforcing exactly what you're saying. Absolutely, and, and that's, there's so much science behind that, that short clip right there that's spot on. You're exactly right. The more persuasive the story, when we're really touched by a story, why is that? Because it's told in a way that are as easy for our minds to picture. So that's the criteria we're always looking for. And so you're, you're spot on. One thing that I think is really helpful here, too, that oftentimes we can get caught up with. I mean, you mentioned having a compelling introduction. You're exactly right on that. Uh, the research shows the introduction shapes the perception of a story. So we want to tell our introductions in a way that if we stopped, people would say, wait a minute, I, I, I want to know more, right? Tell me more, tell me more. And so we want to gear them that way. We want to make sure, too, that we remove any unnecessary details. Oftentimes, I see salespeople cluttering up their stories so they're distracting. Um, I'll give you one example of this that happened a couple of years back in a workshop I did. We had a workshop on stories, leveraging this science and how to tell them. And at the end of the workshop, everyone created a beautiful third-party story of a, of a customer, just like you mentioned, Patricia, and they can use the next day on sales calls. One of the participants did a phenomenal job. She told a story, but she described the potential customer that she was working with as tight as bark on a tree. Tight as bark on a tree. So after the story was told, we go around the room and everyone offers some feedback, you know, some constructive criticism and then also what they really loved about the story. And everyone mentioned to a person, I loved when you used the phrase, tight as bark on a tree. Even one of the sales managers in the room told her, you know, when you said that, I began to think, do all trees have bark? When it got to my turn, I went through and talked about the many things she had done well, but then I surprised everyone. And I told her to cut the phrase tight as bark on a tree. And here's why. It distracted away from the point of the story. It was so compelling that it took everyone's mind and distracted it. And what the science shows is our brains are amazing, but they can only focus on one idea at a time. And so when people are thinking about, in this case, bark on a tree, eh, they're not thinking about anything that's related to the story. So keep your stories lean. Add in the necessary information, but don't clutter them up. And last thing I'll share about stories real quickly is what happens after the story is told is extremely important. You want to tell your potential customers what the story means. And so make sure you do that. Tell them what the story means right after you're done in one sentence. And this will make your stories much more compelling and persuasive. Mm. Very good. Now, I see that we have a question, Paul, from Joyce. Yes, we do. Joyce said, <clears throat> I'm assuming this is part of a sales conversation, but she says, how about persuading people to consider things like current climate science to someone who doesn't trust science? Mm. Interesting question. Yes, so you can leverage, there's a wealth of scientific information and say, how do people create perceptions? And how do I get through to someone who might be antagonistic to my ideas? One tip that I'll give you that research shows that's relevant for, for the question, as well as for those who are talking to clients who might not see a need for your product or service, right? You try to approach a target client and you try to initiate a conversation, but they just don't see why they need your product or your service, so they're not really engaging with you. What can you do? For both of these situations, what I recommend and what the research shows is to interrupt them with an insight. What is an insight that you can share that is something that is in your favor, but also something they could agree with? So if I'm dealing with someone like the climate change who might not be in agreement with my position on that, I want to understand from their perspective, what is some common ground that we have? And how can I shape my insight to appeal to that common ground and then nudge them in my direction, right? So the insight, they are going to agree with part of it, but part of it they might, you know, they might have to think about a little bit. But so I, instead of being antagonistic to them, I want to introduce common ground and then slightly nudge them in my direction. And that will lower resistance and you'll gain an audience and at least start a dialogue and you can get in at least with establishing some common ground which has been shown to boost trust because here's what the research does show as well 
we trust those who agree with us, even mm -hmm. if in small ways. So if you want to get someone to at least listen to you, say something that you have common ground on, and then take them a little more in your direction with that insight. And it's a great way to start a conversation. And, and this makes perfect sense in any dynamic. If you were sitting around the table deciding where you're going on vacation and everyone has a different idea, well, let's start with what we agree on. We want the vacation together. Yes. We don't want to go abroad. We want to be in America. Start with little we agree, we agree. So then it's easier to come closer together with what we don't agree. Yes. That's and, uh, yeah, that's great. A couple more things to add that we've already talked about. We talked about social proof. This is another yes. way you could show what are a lot of people similar to them embracing. So if there's a point in favor of your argument that a lot of people in their camp agree with, also bring that out to light. Again, we're very persuaded by those who are just like us. So you can leverage social proof and similarity, which are both heuristics, like we talked about a few minutes ago, in your favor, and that's going to shape perception, and people are more likely now to listen to and respond positively to your message. All right, now see if, if there's any science behind this, because obviously we, we want to go in. Uh, stories is one aspect of a sales conversation and presentation. Yes. So I want to know what other aspects you can bring in. What I train, now I didn't ask you about this, but you'll see if, it, if there's any science behind it, that if you work on the principle, our prospects are more interested in themselves than they are in us. Yes. People do not invest in our products or services just because it's good for us. They do it because we've, they have decided it's in their best interest to do so. So I train in person and with my virtual training that in audience, any audience, whether it's one person, five, ten, or an audience of a thousand, we need to use more you-focused language rather than I-focused language, not no. I'm going to tell you what I want to do is know what you will hear, what you will learn, what you will discover. What, will you, what you will realize is this of the three options you have for a new vendor, this option could very well be your best. So is there any science behind you focus language and being more persuasive? Yes, there's a lot that talks about understanding the person we're trying to persuade. The research shows it's very difficult to try to get people to be interested in you if you're not interested in them, meaning you have to understand where they're starting. And oftentimes, I know when I work with salespeople, I break their hearts when I say that no one cares about your company, your product, or your service. They don't care. What they care about, to your point, is what matters to them, right? Your potential customers have certain needs they care deeply about. And the more you can connect the dots and show them how your company, your product, or your service can meet their needs in meaningful ways, more about you. So I think using new language is a powerful strategy to help make it easy for their brains to see the value you're presenting by making it focused on them. So it kind of cuts down some of the, the mental cognitive tasks we have to do. Another one I recommend is clearly connecting the dots. So when you're presenting your product or service, uh, feature benefit statements, right? Instead, connect the dots between your feature or benefit and what matters to them. So for example, if I'm selling someone a software package and I go through and I know what matters to them, when I talk about a feature that's relevant I might say, Patricia, a few minutes ago, you told me that reporting was something you really wanted in your next platform. Well, let me show you exactly how our uh, software system will exceed all your expectations in reporting. And then now I'm going to get your attention, and then I can leverage that. So as I, as I present my product or service to make it always about your potential customer, not just about how great your product or service is. And when you do that, people will respond much more favorably. Wonderful. Now, Paul, let's, uh, let's go to David's website and show people where they can get the book. Uh, and, so did I, did I not call you Paul? You did. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little confused sometimes. Uh, it's, it would not be 
unlike me, to be focusing so much on David that I call Paul David. So here we are. So this is, have a look. This is to answer the question. This is the book. And I got an advanced copy, which is because I hadn't met David before I read his book and uh, then said, hey, it sounds as if our content is so perfectly matched, uh, let's do a webinar together. And I'm quite confident, David, that we will be doing another next year on a part two. Uh, so tell, tell everyone and, and Paul to direct you uh, where you want us to look. So here's the book. Yep, Paul, you can click on that book if you would. And this is my new book, The Science of Selling. This is the book's page. And Paul, if you scroll down a little bit, uh, this book is based on over 1,000 scientific studies. And it's very practical, easy to read. It covers the major parts of the sale, but everything we suggest in the book is all backed by real science. And if you scroll down just a little more, Paul, this will uh, show some of the places. The book is available anywhere fine books are sold. And we've had many top sales leaders, business leaders say some very nice things about the book. And it advocates a science-backed perspective. And what does that mean exactly? It means that everything in the book is focused on the buyer. So when we look at, for example, how should we ask questions? We have a whole chapter on that. We don't survey salespeople to find out how they're asking questions. Instead, we look at our buyers and we ask this question. How has science shown the brain discloses information. And then we create a questioning strategy based on that science. So everything is backed by science. And this is one way you can look and learn more information about the book. You can also go to Amazon or anywhere else and you can see some previews of the book as well. And if you scroll down just a little more, Paul, there's a video that describes the book here as well as some sample chapters to um, you can kind of see what the chapter titles are on our page. One other uh, part of our website I'll recommend is Paul, if you click on the resource center there at the top. You've got articles and videos and white papers and your blog and a newsletter and podcasts. Wow. Very, very good. Now, David, are you still with me? It looks like David froze for just a moment, so. Okay, well, well, wonderful, because we've looked through, so please take advantage of this. So you would go to hoffeldgroup.com and click on the Resource Center. The video that goes with David's, uh, David's book, of course, we put as part of the invite, so you probably have already seen that. Now, while we're here, Paul, can we go over, go back to FRIP virtual training? Because there, there are probably uh, some of uh, David's fans who are not familiar with my work. So if you are going to FRIP VT, and I encourage you to sign up for a free trial, you can get a free chapter on openings, on stories, and on sales. The first the first chapter in the sales course and if you were interested in FRIP VT for your your team we'll happily have a conversation and do a, a, a demo for you there is testing tracking and monitoring built within it so you can see who is taking advantage of the training if you're a sales manager for you as an individual and uh, Paul, let's just do an overview of what's in the training center. There are certainly handouts in the file vault, but the training center, this is where we were before with the sales presentation, but we have all aspects of presentation from getting started, finding your content, telling stories, opening, connecting to your audience, uh, being specific, specific language, it builds your credibility. Oh, and I see David is not frozen. He is nodding, so he's back with us for a second. And the sales presentation, and we've added for the Frip VT users, we've added three new chapters as well as all the webinars. So, for example, maximizing your executive overview is a one chapter, four and a half minute course. And this is the specific language you will use when the situation is you're delivering a webinar 
to your prospects. And they call you the day before and said, great news, David. Our boss is going to be in the first five minutes of your webinar demo. And how do you invest those first five minutes to make this connection while you're doing the, the demo for the rest of the team? And all the scripts are in your file book. So we, we certainly recommend you take a free trial. And just to put this into context, a year's access to Frit VT is, is less than one hour's of coaching time with, with someone like David or me. So it's a great way uh, to train a team. Or once you've had training, because certainly David and I make our living training, however, this is the dirty little secret with the training industry. When you have a great speaker with, a great, with great content and an audience who is genuinely, genuinely interested, two weeks later, chances are they've forgotten 70% of what they, they learned that they loved. So this is why you do need some way of repetition and reinforcement to maximize your investment. So that is so good. So they, we showed them around your website. So they see all the resources. Uh, you know, Frit VT, we're encouraging you to take a trial. And just because you're on this webinar or watch the replay, if you would like to use a coupon code FRIP, my name, you can save uh, 20%. So a very small investment for high quality training. All right, so uh, let's come back to David Good. All right, so what other comments can you tell us about science that we'll read about in your book at, for other aspects of the sales presentations? Mm. Yeah, I'll give you two real quickly that can help with sales presentations. And number one is sometimes counterintuitive, and that is limit the amount of information you present in a sales presentation. Oftentimes, we present way too much information, and research conclusively shows that this drives down the likelihood of the sale. In fact, uh, some one of the hallmark studies in this area happened many years ago by a famous psychologist named George Miller. And he studied, of all things, the number seven. He called it the magical number seven, his research found. And he found that our brains are amazing organisms, as we know. Uh, but they have limited capabilities. And one of those limited capabilities is their ability to process information. All right. Well, I think David froze again, and I think he is telling us that there is a limited amount of information that the brain can actually uh, retain. So it's the adage is it is better to give more content, deliver it well, and have them remember it. So David is, is coming back to us. Uh. But he'll be glad to know I filled in the blank. It is much better to give less content, do it well, and have them remember. Excellent. And I don't think we need science to know that so many of our prospects do so much research before they actually talk to us that they already have learned what the what if you think a sales professional 10 or 15 years would spend the first 45 minutes telling them about now they know before we pick they pick up the phone or have an appointment with us absolutely yeah and in, 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 in addition to that limiting choices as well one study found that when when people were presented with 24 different options to choose from only 3% of them did. When they limited down to just six, sales increased by 900%. And every piece of research shows that limiting choices. A second thing you can do in your presentations is use pictures as much as possible. There's something researchers refer to as the picture superiority effect, PSE. And the picture superiority effect finds that the brain thinks in terms of pictures. For example, when I say New York City, Patricia, what do you think of? I'm seeing, I am seeing New York City. I'm seeing the Empire State Building. Yes. And exactly. Our, our, our brains don't think in terms of numbers. They think you see the Empire State Building. You see something that you relate to New York, like a taxi cab. Well, that's how our brains work. So using pictures 
increases cognition, our understanding, and also retention. One study found, for example, that when one presentation didn't have any pictures in, 72 hours later, only 10% of it was remembered. When that same presentation was injected with pictures that demonstrated the ideas, retention went up to 65% within 72 hours when it was tested later. So help people understand and process the information you're sharing and remember it by instead of just talking about it as much as possible, use pictures, and that'll help illustrate visually the words you say. And, and this brings up a, another area of training that I, I often use, and this comes from a book which is out of public, out, it's not published anymore. I, I saw it advertised for $832 secondhand on Amazon, but this is, you just have to understand the premise. Eugene Schwartz said, forget nouns, adjectives, pronouns, adverbs, there are only two types of words, picture words, and connecting words. Mm. Though some pictures, some words have pictures. So for example, I was helping someone with a speech and they said the actual words, this was a lawyer, he promised her many things. I said, no, he didn't. He promised her a life of adventure and romance. And with those words, there's more emotion and picture than it takes to say it. Uh, one financial advisor, her tagline on her website was, it was, it was, and I didn't know I was going to do this, but she was saying it was comparing her, her, her service to the speed of FedEx and the, the quality and customer service of the Ritz Carlton. So with just making two comparisons, FedEx, you can you can just see the truck, Ritz Carlton if you've ever stayed there. So that has emotions and pictures and you said it in a few sentences. Mm. And this is part of making what you say more sticky. Yes. Yeah, our, th our brains think in terms of pictures. So the more you can help people visualize what you're saying, yeah. same is true with stories, and also showing them pictures. If you're having like a PowerPoint presentation that, or yeah. Prezi, yeah, use, and that's one important point. If you have a presentation you're using, let it be dominated by pictures, not text. Cut the text as much as possible. Uh, you don't need to have text in there. Oftentimes, we as speakers and trainers, and I know you can speak to this more than I, Patricia, we use our presentations kind of as a script or reminders. We need to learn them enough so we're not dependent on text. We can have pictures, and then we describe the pictures and convey the ideas. Exactly. Well, especially my corporate clients and the phrases, look, they are visual aids. They're not yes. scripting aids. You yes. put together what you're going to say and then ask yourself, where do I absolutely need a graph, a chart, an image to reinforce what I'm saying? You're going to say it. No one can be more compelling than you. Good. Well, now it's the time for you to tell everyone what they are going to receive with the replay link. Yes. What is this special gift we Oh, call? it's good. We are going to send to all of you 10 scientifically proven sales hacks infographic. This was an infographic that I made with Selling Power magazine. And oh, of course, is, I see Gearhart's a fan of yours right. and he is of mine. Yeah. He's great, yeah. And this is exclusive for those who are live with us or watch the replay. We are going to send you this. It is two sentences on what the science-based sales hack is and two sentences on how you can apply it immediately. It's 10 of them, it's packed with strong content, and it's something I know you'll love. Perfect, wonderful. Now, Paul, do we have any questions that we need to answer? No, we don't. Well, good, there's plenty of comments, but they're good. This is, this is absolutely wonderful. So in our last couple of minutes, apart from going to your website, Hoffield Group, H-O-F-F, -F -F, there's no I, E-L-D, hoffeldgroup.com, go to the researches, order the book, and how fast will they receive the book? Can they buy it from your website or just from any of their favorite? 
Yeah, there's links on our website to all kind of retailers, but you can buy it wherever fine books are okay. sold. Okay, perfect. Good. And this is one way they can certainly, well, there are two ways that you can make, increase your sales in 2017. One, well, three, listen to the replay, mm -hmm. uh, get David's book, and either watch your Frit VT and sales presentations and the new courses we have on sales, or you can take a free trial of Frit VT and then subscribe, join, use Frip as a coupon code. If you want a conversation with either Paul or me, we'll very happily do that, but take a trial. You owe it to yourself. As the buyers are getting fussier, as the competition is getting tighter, you owe it to yourself to increase what you know about persuasion and the science behind selling. So, David, what is your walk-away advice for our listeners? Selling is just too important to be based on anything other than proven science. There is a science that describes how our potential customers make buying decisions. And when you leverage this science, you'll develop an unfair advantage over your competitors who are not. Well, thank you, and I look forward to having another webinar with you, my new best friend. I hope at some point we get to collaborate together in person as well as online. Uh, thank you very much for subscribing to our webinar. And remember, all learning requires repetition and reinforcement. Thank you. Stay tuned. Watch for your next invite, which is to have a conversation, my friend, Jim Pensero. So thank you, David. And thank you, Paul. And remember, there's a science behind Seth.